if you break the capacity to make enough energy to make money, then you run out of money to fix things. And I was like, oh my God, this whole chronic fatigue syndrome is not made up. People have been suffering from the consequences of infections for years and, the gov and everyone's just been writing them off. Even though we have a lot of psychological stress, we don't have a lot of physical stress in modern life. And this is part of the reason why people are getting so sick. So movement is life. And like, you know, think about stagnant water, it breeds disease. Stagnant bodies breed disease. Mismatch of what we're designed to do versus what we live now to do. And so this is why biohacking has taken off. Dr. Malouf is on an ambitious mission to redefine healthcare by integrating medicine, technology, education, and media. Her goal is to radically extend health span and unlock the full potential of the human body and mind. As a society, we see an increase in loneliness. In fact, loneliness is worse for your health than smoking, drinking, sedentary behavior, and obesity. We can talk about it later. About 20% of women are like, I just don't want to have sex and it's affecting my life and affecting my relationship and affecting my partnership. And I am genuinely concerned about robots like falling in love with humans. Well, women, humans falling in love with robots and then giving up on humans. And I think we need a third sexual revolution. If you would have an opportunity to go back in time, what would you say to yourself? Oh, I would say... The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Dr. Molly, welcome to the Thank show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for that great intro. <laughs> Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I'm very excited to talk to you. Uh, I've, I've been watching a lot of your content, and this is great for me because we typically don't hit on a lot of these contents, including psychedelics. And so I'm interested in getting the conversation started, but I'd love to first start off our conversation with some foundational knowledge for our listeners. So I want to start off by talking about the importance of metabolic yes. health. How does, that's a, it's a word that's thrown around, sounds simple, but maybe it's not. How does one know if they are metabolically healthy? Because apparently many of us are in fact not. And why, why do we care about this? Why is it so important to pay attention to our metabolic well, health? 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. And it's not surprising that we're seeing significant rates of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, and mental illnesses. So for a long time, people were really excited about the genetic revolution. And they thought that genetics could explain all of our health problems. And don't get me wrong, it certainly opened up a lot of opportunity for rare disease drug development, but it didn't solve a lot of our mainstream chronic diseases that are killing most people. So the new theory on the block is the mitochondrial theory of metabolic dysfunction preceding most chronic diseases. So essentially your mitochondria take in substrates, which is basically food, air, and water. And we use these mo molecules to create energy and to create what's really called an electrochemical gradient and also a capacitor. So if you learn basic physics, you learn about batteries and capacitors. It's a way to store energy and deploy energy. So if the capacity for creating proper amounts of energy in the body starts to break down, then it's kind of really, it's actually very challenging for the body to maintain the integrity of the structure. Because if you think about a general contractor coming into a house to make some upgrades, if there's no power to the house, their power tools aren't gonna work. So, um, right. you know, for a long time, everyone thought it was the architectural plans that were wrong, right? That genetics is wrong. And don't get me wrong, if the architectural mm. plans are wrong, it's not going to be fully functioning house. But what we're learning is that really energy um, capacity 
is fundamental to optimal health. And in order to have better energy, you have to think about the basics first and foremost, which is what you eat, what you breathe, what you drink, um, whether you have toxins in your environment or your lifestyle, such as alcohol, cigarettes, and hard drugs, um, whether you have social disconnection, which we're discovering is one of the most stressful things on a human body. In fact, loneliness is worse for your health than smoking, drinking, sedentary behavior, and obesity, which we can talk about later. It's really profound. Um, and I can, I, I can basically trace a lot of this back into what's called mitochondrial allostatic load, which is called MAL in the, in the, in the literature. And it's when there's, when you have more stress than your body can take, things start to break down because you don't have enough. It's kind of like having money in the bank. If you spend all the money you got in the bank, right. you're broke. Same thing happens on a cellular level with ATP, which is energy currency of the cell. If you break the capacity to make enough energy and make money, then you run out of money to fix things. So I love first principles and working in Silicon Valley for 10 years really taught me to think on first principles. And so it took me literally 10 years to be able to properly articulate the importance of optimizing your lifestyle for optimal energy, for optimal health. And so um, in my book, The Spark Factor, I talk a lot about the four you know, pillars of health, which is um, you know, optimizing your nutrition, optimizing your movement, because energy, like you're basically, your movement is the signal to create more energy in the cell. Your body is a prediction machine. Mm -hmm. It's always trying to predict the next day. So if you don't give it demands, it says, well, I guess I don't really need extra energy because I'm not really running around like crazy. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to make less. So the less you move, right. the less energy you make. And that's really fundamental. So movement is life. And like, you know, think about stagnant water. It breeds disease. Stagnant bodies breed disease. And then, wow. so there's stress, movement, mastering your, your, your metabolism through your food, really your, your fuel. And then, um, within that category would be gut health as well. You can't ignore gut health. And then last okay. is connection. So one of my friends said, why do you need to know about mitochondria to understand the, you know, that these are just the basics that you need to recommend to people. But I think the why is really important for people to understand why, like the why of why do, why do we need these basic things is helpful because it's hard to change behavior. It's hard to change your lifestyle. And that's part of the reason why I talk a lot about personal health technologies in my book, because what you, what you need is, is, is obviously we need the same things. We need to eat well, we need to exercise more, we need to stress less and we need to connect more, but we all have unique environments. We all have unique people we spend time with. We all have unique demands at, at work. So that's why I like using laboratory testing and personal health technologies to kind of triangulate what does an individual need and um, how can you be more precise about what you recommend to an individual Do you know if person? the number of the metabolic healthy people going up or going down? Uh, I think it's according. Well, I mean, COVID did a number on everybody. And so what people, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize about infections is that viral infections in particular um, that get inside the cell, they hijack, they hijack metabolic machinery and they use your body to make themselves and they cause lots of inflammation. So we've had a pandemic of viral infections of COVID, right? So, you know, we've always had viral infections, but COVID was a pretty pernicious one. So a lot of people who were generally healthy um, got sick with COVID and are like, oh my God, my brain's not working. Oh my God, I'm not like, you know, like mm. this stuff is not working in their bodies, right? And there's a lot of people experiencing post-COVID syndrome, which is a metabolic disease of the mitochondrial health. Eric Topol wrote a great article on this, basically saying we need to commit massive government resources to understanding the role of mitochondria and the relationship to COVID so we can fight long COVID. I actually discovered this the summer before COVID in 2019. I was studying viruses and I was like, wow, we're really overdue for a pandemic and we don't really know how viruses work or how to treat them. And it seems like there's a link to metabolic disease from viral infections and chronic fatigue syndrome can be explained through chronic infections. And that's when a light bulb went off my head and I was like, oh my God, this whole chronic fatigue syndrome is not made up. People have been suffering from the mm. consequences of infections for years and the government and everyone's just been writing them off. So when I was talking right. to my friends about this, I was like, you know, we're overdue for a plague. It's probably going to be a viral plague and we're going to see mass amounts of, of chronic fatigue syndrome. And everyone's like, what are you even talking about? And this was before the pandemic. So I had a lot of foresight 
it was really weird just to have wow. it all come true. I felt very like prophetic at the time, but um, it was really an interesting experience for sure. But basically, I think we as a society try to we're, we need to we need to try to create um, solutions to problems that and, and explanations to problems because everyone's running around. You know, I spoke to a guy in Abu Dhabi and he was like, oh, I'm investing all this resources into studying the genetics of diabetes for our population. And I said to him, you don't need to spend your money on genetics. Like we actually understand that the genetics of a person who lives in the desert is not the same as a genetics, like a, a person who would be a, um, a like Bedouin, for example, who becomes a city dweller, has the genetics of a Bedouin, mm -hmm. has the genetics of very efficiently taking energy in and creating, um, creating fat from it. Right. So like if you didn't eat for a few days because you were traveling around deserts, moving around in a, in a group of people, you create really e efficient metabolism. So when you take a person like this and put them in an environment like Abu Dhabi or Dubai, and they're eating extremely rich foods and not moving their bodies, there's a mismatch of your genetic design and your lifestyle in modern life. So we, we, mm. we are trying to overcomplicate why people are getting sick. It is extremely explainable right. through breaking metabolism and the mismatch of what we're designed to do versus what we live now to do. And so this is why biohacking has taken off because people are figuring out, oh, if I fast, oh, if I go into ketosis, oh, if I do more exercise and, and I change the way I exercise, oh, if I like change my calorie intake on different days, I can actually cross train my metabolism and learn and train my mitochondria to burn fat versus carbs. And I can now start to optimize mitochondrial function from other things like sauna and cold plunge from, you know, um, altitude training, for example. So there's a lot of things that we're learning are biohacking tools like HBOT or even ozone. Um, and these tools are really mitochondrial hormetic stressors and hormesis is the stress that makes you stronger. So we have a very, even though we have a lot of psychological stress, we don't have a lot of physical stress in modern life. And this is part of the reason why people are getting so sick. Mm. It's because we have very cushy, That's convenient true. lives and we're disconnected, yeah. unfortunately, from human relationships. Hey there, before we dive back into the episode, I wanted to stop for just a brief moment and express our heartfelt gratitude. Knowing that you've chosen to spend your time with us to listen and engage with our content truly warms our hearts. Every story we share, every topic we discuss is made much more meaningful if you are here with us on this journey. If you found value in what you've heard so far and you're excited as we are about the episodes to come, we'd be so honored if you'd hit that subscribe button. It not only ensures you stay informed of all of our new content, but it also supports us in continuing to create and share. From all of us here, a sincere thank you. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the episode. You know, you mentioned about biohacking, so I, I'm interested in getting more into this. But before I do, so I I went across your LinkedIn article, and actually, I, I saw you write an article about the supplements that you were taking while COVID yeah. was rampant. Uh, I want to talk about the supplements category because I feel like there's a lot of people like me, uh, and this is the question I'm about to ask you. So I just looked at your spreadsheet. And I was like, what the hell is a spreadsheet in the nicest way possible? Because there's a lot of things on there. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I like to research and, and, and do various kinds of things, but there's so many people like me, we just get lost. Like what supplements do we take? There's, you know, every new, every other day I'm take I'm looking at this next new miracle thing. Hey, you need to take NAD plus from true Niagen and you need to take this and you need yeah. to take that. So can I ask you a basic sure. question? Let's and obviously this is this is not an answer that applies to everybody, but let's just assume my blood work comes in relatively healthy, normal. We're not, you know, vitamin D deficiencies and other things like that. Uh, and let's even further classify it down to I'm a man, yeah. right? And so I'm, I'm sure it's different for for men and women. Where do I get started? Because I sure. feel lost. I mean, Vlad's uh, Vlad does he's he's great at this, but for me, I just feel lost. So since you're an yeah. expert. I want to, you know, I, I want to biohack. I want to do some things. Uh, I, I take NAD plus currently, but what other things should I be taking? Or, you know, sure. what would you recommend and how do I get well, started? Well, first of all, I had a friend who's like 30 years old who was taking a bunch of NAD and he wasn't sleeping. And because of the so NAD, he wasn't, he wasn't sleeping? sleeping well. After? He was taking too much NAD. And so 
I think is, okay. is that you've got to really recognize that like somebody who's 40 is not the same as someone who's 30. So if you're young and healthy and fit, you don't need to be taking a bunch of NAD. You, ha- you should have you enough speak in about your body. Too much, um, now, if you're an alcoholic, when you speak about too what? much, too much is how much? Um, I would say if you're 30 years old and you're generally healthy and this guy was super fit, you shouldn't be taking NAD or precursors. You don't mm. need it. You're too young. Okay. Um, if you're an alcoholic or a smoker, maybe. But if he was extraordinarily healthy, did not smoke and did not drink. So I would save NAD for when you're older, when you're starting to hit your... Okay, so I'm already taking the wrong things. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing. Yeah. So once, you you're hit, once you start hitting 40, that's when you can start optimizing the NAD levels. Um, and all, if you had just gotten COVID and you felt really exhausted, that would be a reason to try some NAD as a response okay. to illness, but not as a daily thing that you think is going to give you longevity because there's no evidence that that is true. Um, mm. it's, it does decline with age. And so it does seem like it's better for people who are older, but I think we had this, um, big belief, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we're like, Oh, antioxidants are the secret to longevity. And we discovered that that isn't always the case. So if you take antioxidant supplements during or around exercise, you actually negate some of the effects of the exercise. Because you need certain amounts of reactive oxygen species to send the signal to the cells to adapt. So it's so important okay. not to overdo or abuse these things and know exactly why you're taking them and know um, when and why you're taking them. So, for example, in my practice, the things that I see people need the most is vitamin D, K1, and K2. So I always complex vitamin D with K1 and K2 for heart health. Um, but I see vitamin D deficiency across the board in people who even live in LA and are outside surfing regularly. So vitamin D deficiency is very common. Um, there's still controversy about replacing the vitamin D, but I, I do believe in it personally for bone health, for brain health, for heart health, for hormone health. Um, then there's magnesium. Can you, can I, I'm sorry. Can you clarify that? You said there's controversy. Yeah, Some doctors literally still don't believe in vitamin D replacement. And I'm just like, the evidence is clear to me as day. But if you live at higher altitudes and you don't get a lot of sun, vitamin D can make a big, really big difference in how you feel. So mm-hmm. I'm a big okay. believer in vitamin D supplementation. It always have been. Um, second thing is magnesium. So magnesium is a important mineral for over 300 reactions in the body, including metabolism, metabolic you know reactions. A lot of people struggle with sleep and magnesium at night mm-hmm. is one of the best tools in the toolbox for getting better rest. If you have muscle tension, if you have muscle soreness, if you have little twitches in your eye because you're tired, you might need more magnesium. If you're craving a lot of chocolate, you probably need more magnesium. So magnesium is really fundamental. I see it. I pretty much have everybody, everybody I work with on it. Um, Omega threes, very controversial because sourcing is really challenging. But if you can look on Mm -hmm. Amazon, there's a company called Norway Direct. It's pharmaceutical grade, high potency, EPA, DHA. You want a non-rancid, high EPA, DHA. You want a gram of, of fish oil in, in one capsule. That's a very high concentrated, potent product. Um, you can also get a prescription for um, omegas from your doctor if you have high, triglyc- high triglycerides or you ask nicely. But um, really, really important is to not consume rancid fish oil. But I do see vitamin E, uh, I do see omega-3 deficiency and high omega-6s in a lot of my clientele, and that does create chronic inflammation. There's endless Mm. evidence that omegas are good for your health. And anybody who argues with me is usually arguing for the argument that there's just too much rancid omegas, which is true. But if you can source it properly Mm. and find a really high quality pharmaceutical grade, Norway sourced omega, it's one of the best things that I take. I take like four grams a day. I take high dose. Um, Oh, wow. It's it's one of the biggest hacks that I found for brain health. Okay. And that's, oh, that's, you can order that on Amazon. So you don't need a prescription you, for that. I mean, if you can you get a prescription, I like the prescription because you know, it's, you know, from a pharmaceutical, but, okay. but okay. Um, if you live in Europe, there's a brand called N pure three. It's hard to get in America. You have to like fly to Norway to get that. Um, hmm. But I've used Norway direct on Amazon. I think it's a good brand. Um, and then okay. the other one I would say that I see a lot of deficiencies in is B12 and folate. So B, I, I recommend a B complex for most people um, because most people don't realize how important B vitamins are to metabolism. And I see B vitamin deficiencies 
in a lot of people. Our fruits and vegetables are getting less and less um, micronutrient rich. So that's Mm. pretty important that you get enough B vitamins. And then I love fulvic acid and humic acid as a mineral source. And you can get this from Beam Minerals. It's a great company. But you need minerals and you need electrolytes. And so basically we used to eat like fruits and vegetables that came straight out of the dirt. And we used to get Mm -hmm. fulvic and humic acids from the dirt. But we're we're not eating dirty vegetables anymore like we used to. So... We're right. eating really clean vegetables at the store. So we're not actually getting some of these extra minerals we used to be getting in our diet. And fruits and vegetables just have less minerals in them. So I take mm-hmm. a full like humic acid for all those reasons. Um, it just covers your bases. And it's an, it's more of a natural product than like just a minerals complex. But um, okay, so that's those are my favorites. And then if you have gut issues, a probiotic, is pretty much a non-negotiable um, if you have gut problems. Now, if you if you have overgrowth, you may actually not benefit from a probiotic. So if probiotics make your gut health worse, you might want to get checked for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I like the brand Seed mm-hmm. as a probiotic. It's a great brand. Um, lots of clinical evidence behind it. And it's helped a lot of my friends with inflammatory bowel conditions. And then my other favorite product is an, a digestive enzyme. So you know, um, I do recommend a higher protein diet than some longevity experts, but that's for health span extension, not necessarily living 130, but to live till I'm 100 okay. and feel and look awesome. So I big, I really big believer in protein intake. And I go through phases where I eat higher protein and I'm bulking up and I eat lower protein when I'm traveling. But generally speaking, digesting food is a problem for some people. And a lot of people have gut problems and gut dysfunction. And I love the company Bio Optimizers and their enzymes are fantastic. I have seen people just do the, uh, this enzyme protocol I prescribe and it improves their digestion rapidly. So big, big believer in those. So that's a lot of different supplements. Um, you know, and then I have things that I take. That is a lot of, you know, I think but those are, those are the basics, you know, those are like the, I think it's also very important to touch uh, I, I, I did the timing. When should you take each of them? Because a lot of them don't go together sure. if you're going to take all, everything at once. Yep. Yeah, I would take your vitamin D in the morning. Um, I would take your enzymes with meals. I would take your, um, you know, B-complex. Um, if you're taking iron, you want to take that um, with a vitamin C. I mean, I take iron for um, for basically, um, you know, just having low ferritin levels. Um, I like taking probiotics at night. I like taking magnesium at night and um, I'm trying to think what else I was recommending. Omegas, I take hmm. those whenever. Probiotics at night. I, I usually take it that o- always in the morning. That so simple, but. You can take them honestly morning or night. It's fine. So I, I do want I, I I did notice I was watching one of your podcasts that you just did talking about the company bio optimizers talking about some spray now we're getting oh yeah the nootropics category or yeah so c- can you talk a little bit about that they have this stuff called zamner spray and it's a oh i feel like this whole <laughs> session is about promoting other Look, companies which by the this. way it's not <laughs> here's the thing here's the thing i know these founders personally and there is a lot okay. of crap out there so sourcing is actually like kind of important like for example, like MitoQ is a form of coenzyme Q10 that has clinical evidence that it mm, gets yeah. inside the cell, actually into the mitochondria. And would I want to recommend people just get a random coenzyme Q10 or would I want to recommend one that I know has clinical evidence behind it that it's actually going to be bioavailable? Do I want to recommend right. random enzymes or do I want to recommend the ones that have an entire lab in Bulgaria dedicated to optimizing this product and testing it and running clinical right, science right. around it? Like. I go deep into the sourcing of everything that I do. And so I think it's almost irresponsible to just say, go take, just go take these things across the board and not give people access to what is actually good because there is so much crap out That's there. That's a good point. There is so much garbage right. out there. And it's not, a, it's, it's not an FDA regulated space, it's not regulated. right? This is the supplements category. So if you go to Amazon, there's 500 companies. A well, lot of them can be malicious actors. Here's the thing, We've like, already... A lot of these small brands get acquired by large brands and then they change the entire mm-hmm. supply chain. So what used to be right, a really good right. brand. That's and true. so right now um, yeah. there's a company that wants me to represent them. And I said, 
I'm only going to promote your products if you show me everything about your sourcing. I want to know exactly where every single product is from. I want to see the third-party testing. I want to know these are quality products. And if they aren't, I'm not going to work with you. Like, it's really important for people to realize that it's a wild west and it always has been. And it's actually like, like even pharmaceuticals, people don't realize this, but like there could be a pharmaceutical that gets approved and it's produced in, in like America. And then it gets out of patent and then it starts getting made in China. And then they start shipping right. this new product in America and like 80% of it is good, but 20% of it is actually just bad. And there's yeah. like, nobody talks about this because the FDA says, well, if like a certain percent of it is like, it has to meet a certain threshold of quality to get approved for use and distribution in America. Most people do not do this kind of research on the drugs that they take. They just go to Walgreens and they just take the drugs. But this entire space right. of pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals, just because something isn't approved by the FDA does not make it safe. Just because something that supplements mm -hmm. on Amazon does not make it safe. So like we all have a responsibility to do much more thorough testing of what we put inside our bodies because, you know, it's our bodies that we're dealing with, you know? And right. Yeah. Uh, I have a subtle subtle question about the supplement. Uh, how much do you spend on your supplements? Oh, hundreds of dollars, of course. But like, a I month? mean, I spend hundred, probably a few hundred a month. And then I also spend money on labs. So I'm testing to see what my body needs so that I'm not necessarily replacing things I don't need. Oh, so okay. is that on a monthly basis or quarterly, how often are you doing the lab quarterly testing? quarterly? Yeah. Okay. Now that's something that I have to do. You can do that. At, I mean, I'm not a representative of inside tracker, but I probably should be because it's the fastest way to get these things done, but it is expensive. Um, but there are doctors, there are more tracker. and more doctors. I mean, I predict in 10 years, there's going to be a, just a general awareness that this is normal to do right now. It's like niche bodybuilders, I biohackers, agree. but it eventually will be, it'll be like, is it the tracker that you, that you put here at all, all the time? I agree. All your, uh... That's a blood sugar testing monitor. So continuous glucose monitoring is a way for you to basically see your blood sugar in real time. And eventually these monitors will have ketone monitors and cortisol type monitors, and we'll have so many different tools to actually analyze our body in real time, but it's just going to take some time for the technology to catch up. I also see a lot of people talk about the uh, low dose metformin. So could you please talk about it and explain what, what, what is I'm not it? A big believer. If you're not a big believer, why? Well, research, recent research suggests that men who take metformin in their Fertile years can increase the risks of birth defects and babies that they they bear with their wives. Oh, wow. So that's a reason why I wouldn't do it. I like the I like the product. Bur I like that's berberine. It's been around for thousands of years as a Chinese medicine. It's not new at all. It's got thousands of years of use behind it, and it's an insulin sensitizer, also known as herbal ozempic. And it's a G it's it, it does have some effects mm -hmm. on GLP one. So. I love, and I've always have, I always have used berberine. And what it does is it actually improves the terrain of your microbiome, which affects your metabolic health. So I'm a big, I mean, I will always choose something more natural over pharmaceutical. What about the rapamycin? Mm. I'm curious about it, but I would probably only start that after I had kids. Cause I just, we, they, there's evidence in animal models that can improve fertility. But I don't think we have enough information on humans to make it to, to to run that risk. So everybody who are considering it first think if you're gonna have kids or not, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But how easy is it to get get access to these things? Actually, I I see so many companies and all these yeah. startups coming out with it's a monthly subscription. I, I, but I you just can get it like without the prescription. Like, people are, look, people it's, are willing it's... to make these risks. No, you need a prescription. You need, a, you need to see, a phys, I guess, one of their physicians and they'll approve you after whatever protocol that they have to follow. So basically, um, but this space is getting basically big. this is something I predicted years ago would emerge, which is the consumer health healthcare system. So because there's a lot of stuff that you can't get from insurance companies because it's not designed for treating disease, it's for optimizing health or longevity. And those are not considered to be diagnostic codes that you can get treatment for mm -hmm. or diagnoses for a lot of these companies have come around and said, 
I'm going to optimize for what people will, are willing to pay cash for. So people are willing to pay cash for labs. They're willing to pay cash for rapamycin. They're willing to pay cash for NAD patches. They're willing to pay cash for supplements. And so you're seeing more and more of these companies emerge that are offering, I mean, even, even like, even, even like Clomid, Maximus, a company that's giving um, a way for people to, to like raise their testosterone levels with a peptide um, mm. pharmaceutical. So there's a lot of these peptide companies you know, and like it, it, there's waves of the FDA cracking down on this stuff, but um, I think the consumer healthcare system is only going to continue to grow. Uh, on since we are on topic of uh, supplements and all this stuff, I saw a podcast that was released a couple of days ago with uh, you and Sarah Macklin. So one of the topics covered were medicinal mushrooms. This is actually the first time I heard about it. It's Lion's Mane. So could you please share more information about it? What are the benefits, what uh, side effects and all about it? Well, things like reishi is known to improve immunity, which I need right now because I have a cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been pushing my travel. I've been traveling a lot. So it's kind of like, I typically, mm. I, I haven't gotten sick in a while, but I had just slowed down from like six weeks of travel. And so that's typically when I'll catch a cold after I've been doing pushing my body for a few weeks. But um, it's been a while. I can't remember the last time I had a cold. So it's a pretty, pretty good sign. So anyway, um, lion's mane is great for neuroplasticity, but you have to take like three grams a day. So that's something that worth worth thinking about. And then there's also um, cordyceps, which is known to improve endurance. So people have been using medicinal mushrooms for a long time. Um, Paul Stamets put his mom on turkey tail after she had cancer and he thinks it played a role mm -hmm. in her, you know, her healing large high doses of turkey tail. So I first learned about medicinal mushrooms reading literally Solzhenitsyn's cancer ward in sixth grade. This stuff is not new. It's been around Russian cultures right. for a lot longer than it's been popular in America. Just like fasting is a new thing mm -hmm. in America. It's been around in Russian cultures for like a lot longer than it's made it to us. So we're just behind the times, honestly, like a lot of what is cutting edge in biohacking was normal in, in Russia. Like, so I'm not trying to defend Russia, but like, I have to say that like, we as Americans think that we know everything that's cutting edge. And some of the stuff that we're doing is just not new. It's just not new at all. Like berberine is not new. It's been in Chinese medicine for thousands of years. I actually never heard about it. It's okay. I, because I came, I came from Uzbekistan and it's post-Soviet Union. So a lot of <laughs> Russians there, but all the stuff I learned in, in, in here in the yeah. US. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're good at marketing. <laughs> right. So America is the marketing capital of the world. So we just make things cool. We just don't want to, we need to, we spend a lot of money making stuff cool and new. Okay. Um, let's switch gears here and speak about your uh, book, The Spark Factor. So could you please share sure. some information about it? What motivated you to write it in the first place? Um, well, I would say that I wrote this book because I'd been working in Silicon Valley and teaching at Stanford and really mostly helping the elite of the world. And I was like, well, I've certainly figured a lot of stuff out that I think everybody should have access to this information. So what better way than to write a book, which can make it to thousands of people. Um, so that's why I wrote it. It was really based on my course I taught at Stanford, my desire to help more people, and just to get the word out on optimizing, on optimizing health. And I learned that biohacking as a woman was not the same as biohacking a man. And so I wanted to help women in particular demystify their biohacking journey and understand there's a little bit more of a gentle path you have to take if you're a woman. Yeah, I, I yeah, I have one more one more question. So you said it's different for men and for women. So if we're speaking about the supplements, should the woman take some additional ones and vice versa? I mean, um any woman who's trying to get pregnant should be on coenzyme Q ten, probably DHEA if it doesn't cause her acne, and a polyphenol just to add extra um you know, just to, the evidence is clear in some of the infertility studies that like there's certain things that you can take to optimize egg quality. So selenium, um, zinc, selenium, acai, 
uh, like uh, powder um, and DHEA and coenzyme Q10 are like extra things you would take if you were uh, trying to get pregnant. And afterwards? I want to go... And yeah. then after, I mean, pregnant? after, like, for example, my wife, she's, she's not looking to be pregnant right now. We already have kids. So after. Yeah. Um, I learned from a friend of mine who was developing a platform around postpartum depletion, that blueberry extract is really helpful for um, postpartum women. And that, um, you know, really getting a nutritional evaluation, which is like, there's a company called Genova Diagnostics. They make this thing called the NutriVal. It's a great way of assessing your nutritional needs. And if you see a bunch of deficiencies, you can be more targeted with how you were to replace. I want to go and talk about something more interesting, which is something that we hit on early on in the podcast. You mentioned the word loneliness sure. and you mentioned how loneliness was worse than obesity alcohol, like drinking alcohol or even taking drugs. So this is something that's very interesting. I do want to talk about this because it seems like as a society, we see an increase in loneliness. Is that correct? Or am I incorrect in saying that? Well, I think the pandemic certainly caused it. I think there was a real, a real isolation of people that was real potent and real obvious that like was required by the government. And so when you change human behavior, it's hard to change it back. Now I went the opposite direction and I went hard on connection after I got vaccinated, which I kind of regret, but mm -hmm. um, I went out of my way to go spend time with fr friends and family and really build up my community back. And I think I've recovered pretty well from the pandemic, but a lot of people haven't. And there's a lot of addiction. There's a lot of uh, families that were torn apart from just frankly too much interaction. And there was a lot of, um, a lot of people got closer, but then there was a lot of people who felt even more isolated and alone. So we just ran a major social experiment that failed miserably. And I don't think it really helped save lives. I think it's probably net negative. And it's also, it's also people during the pandemic, they were forced to work from home. And after pandemic, people get used to working from home and they yeah. kind of loved it working exactly. from home, but okay, you work from home and then what? Then you have nobody to speak with, no colleagues, no, no, nobody, especially if you are alone. That's it. That's why they're working even more. That's why their loneliness skyrocketing. I mean, there's a time and a place for like being in the woods and having some solo time, but most people need more human interaction than they realize. So like I, I'm part of a gym in Austin where if I go to the gym, I see a lot of friends of mine. So I would make sure I go there once a day mm -hmm. so that, I, cause I did work at home and I found that working at home made me sad. So basically part of the reason why I've been traveling is just cause I find that I get more human inter interaction and I'm happier with it when, I, when I'm around more people. And just to clarify, loneliness is a big issue when it comes to metabolic health or what it um, basically perceived social isolation is really what loneliness is, right? It's like, I don't feel like I'm connected. You can be lonely and, and have your mm -hmm. family around you. So then there's objective social isolation, which is you genuinely don't have anybody around. So those are two different mm -hmm. things, but they're within the same sort of confines of not great for the nervous system. So any form of stress like that would make you feel like you were on the outskirts of a community. If you were in primitive times, for example, you would be endangered. So there's like a natural stress response that gets turned on when you feel isolated and alone. And that is designed to bring you closer to your tribe. But we have not, yeah. we've lost that capacity to get people to come closer to their tribe because people don't have tribes anymore. So what can happen when you get lonely is you get this thing called maladaptive social cognition. So you start to perceive your interaction with people as negative, even if it wasn't that big of a deal, even if it wasn't that bad of an experience, mm -hmm. you make it out to be this horrible thing. You make it out to be this thing that just right. like, wasn't great. And now you're like, I don't want to see people because that was really, that was a really bad experience that I had. And so it's so important to treat loneliness as a, as like almost like a 
you have to treat, you have to teach people how to think differently about it so that they can get more social interaction right. so that they don't shoot themselves in the foot with like misinterpreting social signals as bad, even though they're just hypersensitive, you know, it creates a hypersensitization to negativity in the social arena, hmm. which, um, over time, you know, basically like there's a lot of evidence that suggests that loneliness is just bad for metabolic health because it puts you under a high state of stress and that resting stress is draining mm -hmm. your energy resources and creating, you know, dysfunctional cells. Right. That makes sense. Now, two, just two more questions here before we wrap up for you. So I, while I was researching about you, I know you also talk a lot about uh, sexual health and intimacy. And so I, I, I noticed that you, you, you run a company called Adama Bioscience and very curious to learn more about that. So it's a biotech company focused on developing psychedelic compounds to treat hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Uh, okay. Very quickly, just to set the foundational knowledge for listeners here. Can you just briefly talk to us about what HSD sure. is? Um, well, 40% of women and 35% of men have some form of sexual dysfunction. And the most common sexual dysfunction in men is erectile disorder. And the most common sexual dysfunction in women is hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is HSDD, which means about 20% of women are like, I just don't want to have sex and it's affecting my life and affecting my relationship and affecting my partnership. And um, they are in enough distress about it to ask for help. But the problem is, is that there's only two drugs approved for HSDD in the female population. So um, basically my company was initially commercializing a three drug combination that was designed to basically address the three most common causes of HSDD that are psychosomatic in nature, which would be relationship problems, mood disorders, and trauma. But I quickly mm -hmm. realized after a year of drug development that the drug I was trying to develop was probably not going to get across the FDA. So I paused on that. And then I started working on the sex therapy protocol to go alongside the psychedelics that were going to get approved for these conditions. So psilocybin is being studied for depression. MDMA is being studied for trauma and people are even using ketamine as a therapy for couples therapy now in clinical environments because it's legal. Mm. So, um, and then, you know, in the process of building this sex therapy and building a whole, you know, platform around it, we're about to launch our first cohort. What I discovered was the sex therapy alone is actually really effective at helping anyone have better sex, not just somebody without desire. And I was like, whoa, we have a much bigger market for just the education on sexuality. And it turns out that the all like no sex therapies that exist today are actually psychosomatic sex therapies. They're all psychological based. And like the one that's the closest, like the one that's the gold standard, which is sensei therapy is a somatic sex therapy, but it's basically um, mindfulness based sensual touch. And it doesn't actually require sex at all. So what we decided to do at my company was like, well, there's a lot of problems that occur during sex. So what if we taught people actually how to have sex in a way that is, could it cause less pain, more desire, more connection, um, more satisfaction, more secure attachment and more love and intimacy. So we're testing our protocol for both people with HSTD, but also people who are normal, healthy individuals to see if it can not just, not just resolve dysfunction, but also improve sexual function. And then we're also prototyping different plant-based psychedelic products for markets like Colorado and Oregon, where we can run small studies to combine our protocol mm -hmm. and see if we can get some early data on whether these delivery systems of these natural products actually have any efficacy in treating these conditions. So, um, you know, it's, it's a long game, but we have a brand we're building as well. So we're going to be creating media and some products for our brand to just raise awareness around sexuality and sexual health optimization uh, and sexual healing. And I think we need a third sexual revolution. I think it's time that we shift culture around sex because there's a lot of confusion around it. There's a lot of people experiencing trauma. There's a lot of, you know, every day in the news, there's another story of another celebrity who was either traumatized 
or was a perpetrator. And the Me Too movement mm. started something really important in society. But now what's next? What comes after Me Too? Right. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from a more equal world where women have work and money? And where do where, how do women, men and women relate sexually differently in, in this modern life we're living in? How do women get equal pleasure, not just equal pay? Um, and then the other last one is like, how do we look at sex as a healing modality? Like what if, what if having healthier sex could help us improve our relationships, could actually keep relationships together for longer? So I'm on a mission that's much bigger than I thought I was going to be on. And I really believe that metabolic health and human connection are fundamental for human flourishing. So I figured out how to optimize metabolism. Now I'm trying to figure out how to optimize right. connection and what more, what, what is, what is more connected than the act of sex. Right. So, um, I've never really been more excited about what I'm doing. And also like, it's just, um, it's a really phenomenal, like, you know, frontier to be working on this, this like ed of right. sexuality and psychedelic medicine. Oh, I can, I can see the passion actually during the conversation. And I, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that there needs to be a revolution. So this is something that you're probably, I mean, you're obviously very passionate about. And uh, we look, I mean, we, we look forward to seeing the data. I know that you said that you have a fall cohort coming out. I did see that uh, on your website as well. Uh, and, then, and then one random, uh, one question that you may not know the answer to, but because it's such a hot topic, you know, artificial intelligence, AI, generative AI, do you think it's going to cause more problems in the relationships department. We're talking about oh, AI sure. with, I mean, right? So that's even more concerning, even more of the reason why we need something. I mean, it's even more of <laughs> a reason for my company to exist because people are going to get more and more disconnected right. and fall in love with AI. Right. And there's going to be a lot that's of I'm worried about. dysfunctional human relationships because people have had these perfect relationships with AI and they're wondering whether partner is a human and actually has flaws and like doesn't always have to give the right answer. And, you know, these, if we program AI to be this perfect partner, which by the way, I have friends, two friends working at companies that are doing this. So like I am actively involved in this conversation. And I've also worked with people at top levels of some of the largest AI companies in Silicon Valley. So I am literally knee deep in this space and I am genuinely concerned about robots like falling in love with humans. Well, women, humans falling in love with robots and then giving up on humans. And so like it, de it definitely is also part of me is just like, part of me is like, well, at least I've got some, you know, job security because people can have a lot of sexual dysfunction <laughs> after not knowing how to actually have human sex. So, um, right. I mean, look, I'm, I'm on a mission to help humans connect and to have longer lasting relationships because the, the fact is, is that human relationships are linked to longevity. Like if you have healthy, strong right. human relationships, right. you're going to live a longer life. Like high quality, healthy relationships is the greatest factor in longevity and happiness that we know. So close personal relationships are what you should be investing your time and resources in if you want to survive and live a great and healthy and happy life. So this is like why I'm working in the space of human connection. Cause I'm just like, this is the answer. Mm -hmm. This is, this is what really yeah. matters. Yeah, they 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 just they just need to make uh, this a robots AI partners just to cause little bit problems, and people will just say, okay, I don't need yeah. them. Why do I need robots? I'll go to humans. <laughs> well, you, you, there's a, I forget the name, but there's a very famous technologist who said, he, I think he just had a baby, and he said, unfortunately, I'm very confident that my child's first girlfriend will be an AI powered something. Think about it. Seven years, eight years from now, right? It's it's going to be some AI companion that we're, they're going to get their hands on and, you know. We are so screwed anyway, if that happens. A, like, oh, it's, it's going just, to happen. I thought about it. So I, will, I will move to, I will so move to, to some is it, uh, is it not true? country. It's true. It. There are going to be no AI. It's fine. I, I mean, this is why I love being in Europe is because like none of this stuff has gotten there yet, really, as intensely as it has okay. here. America is just going to fall. Let's get real. <laughs> like America is just going to fall apart, it seems. And um, I don't know, like I'm, I'm, I might even move back to the Bay Area just because 
I think that there's a lot of hope for creating a, a better future from this place, but I think we need more people like me here to actually influence culture because there's a lot of people just working in these silos of these companies, not thinking about the consequences of their actions and their, and their work that they're creating. And um, we need a humanistic element to like the design of these technologies. You know, we need mm. to really be thinking about how these things. We need more people be. like you at the top, not whoever is working. Whoever is working, they just do whatever is told from from the top. I know. And they know, and they know the consequences. Know. So <laughs> it's fine. Um, I have one last question to you. Um, if you would have an opportunity to go back in time, what would you say to yourself? Oh, I would say you don't, well, it's funny thing is, is like, like it wasn't until like literally the, like the last year of like hyper overachievement that I was like, there's no amount of achievement that's going to bring you total satisfaction with your life. So you really should just start factoring in more recovery and rest and more, you know, just you don't have to push it so hard, so fast for so long. Like you can rest, you can slow down, you can smell the roses a little bit more. And don't get me wrong. Like, I actually think I've lived more in 10 years than some people will ever live in their entire lives. Like, I think I've lived a really full, mm -hmm. but I haven't given my body enough recovery. And so I'm almost 40 mm -hmm. and I've been treating my body like a high performance race car. And I've just fixed anything it breaks, but it's like, maybe you just should not break in the first place. You know, I'm really good at fixing things mm. that break, but also it's, there's a, there's a whole nother story of like just taking better care of the car, you know, and just taking to more pit stops and just like not necessarily like taxing the system so hard so that you have to fix it, okay. you know? So that's kind of where I'm at now in my new decade. It's like, how can I live a life of more effortless ease and more flow and call in more balance and harmony and more support? And I'm just like really grateful for, for that. This is actually, th th this is, Realizing. this is a time. That is great advice. I mean, from 20 to 30 is one race from 30 to 40, you should really kill it in order to be able to, from 40 yeah. and up to relax and take it easy. Yeah, exactly. And don't get me wrong. I'm not like, slowing down, I'm probably going to be more productive in my forties because I've set so many things up in my thirties mm -hmm. and I feel more, I mean, I am far more aware of who I am now than I did than I was 10 years ago. And so I have a lot more like self-worth and self uh, confidence and like, just, I know who I am. I know where I'm going and I know why. And that is, that is not what everybody has. And so that's a very, if you, if you figure that out in your thirties, like great job. Um, a lot of people never mm. figure it out and feel lost their entire lives. So I do think you do have to yeah. push hard in your thirties, but in your forties, you shouldn't just, I mean, it depends on how ambitious you are. Like I, I look at Peter Atia, who's almost 50. Right. And I'm like, I, and I look at Huberman who's almost 50 and I'm like, I'm pretty happy yeah. with where I'm at at 40, you know, like I'm pretty, yeah. pretty accomplished young woman. Um, but there's things I haven't done yet. There's things that I want to do. And I think there's a lot more, um, waiting for me in my forties. And I'm, I feel pretty lucky to have gotten to this point and be like happy with who I am, which is pretty cool. I love that Dr. Molly. It's been an incredible pleasure getting to speak with you today to wrap it all up. We have one last question that we always like to ask all of our guests to get to know them just a little bit more better personally. That question is, uh, who has been one of the most strongest or most inspiring individuals in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? Ooh, this is a really good one. So one of my friends, Tom Chi, is a technologist, inventor, and just really inspirational person who is probably the most humble and highly accomplished person I've ever met. Like really lives in a state of like spiritual balance with and harmony with his existence and is extraordinarily giving to the world and selfless. And he was one of the reasons why I started my company because I was working for so many other companies and I was really distributing my energy to like helping like 50 something companies. And he's like, Molly, you are good enough to be a founder. Like you are smart enough to build something on your own. Mm -hmm. You just have to go do it. And he wouldn't let me give up and he 
pushed me to actually start my company. And he's been a huge support and advisor and investor. And I think that I look at the way he's built his career and the way that he's created his um, just like unbelievably successful first venture fund that is called At One Ventures. And it's investing in technology that's net positive for nature and humanity. And it's mm. outperforming like 95% of all venture funds, maybe 99% at this point. Wow. And he did it by building it on first principles and really trying to like innovate in the investment thesis of, well, not only innovating on what he invests in, but also innovating in how he invests and not investing the way most of Silicon Valley invests, but investing the way that would be based on like real diligence on companies. And so mm. he's just, he's confident. And he knows he's what he's he knows what he's good at, and he's like humble, and he's accomplished, and he's just um, one of the most talented people I've ever met in my entire life. So hugely, hugely, hugely grateful for this person because I wouldn't be on this path if I didn't have him tell me it's possible. And it's like you got to have someone champion you, especially when like you're not even sure Definitely. you can do it. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It's a, that's, everybody has a different response, but that's usually the person that really pushes them and drives them to be something better, to accomplish great things. Dr. Molly, once again, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you today. I've learned a lot. I'm going to start taking magnesium at the nighttime. I will go ahead and start doing quarterly checkups. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward uh, to seeing all the great things that you'll be accomplishing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.